Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Scott Palmer, who is um, a graduate of Oberlin College prior to becoming a lifelong Dukey. He came to Duke for his undergraduate medical education and then stayed for internal medicine residency and fellowships in pulmonary critical care, um, during which time he also uh, received a master's of health sciences and has had a really tremendous rise in um, a broad research, with a broad research agenda from basic translational, active, very well-funded lab to um, clinical translational and actually then uh, clinical trials. And it's, it's been great for somebody who um, shares an interest in trying to bridge that gap to learn from somebody who's done it so well. He's been very well recognized for all of this work. Um, he has a K24 for, from the NHLBI for his mentorship. Um, he's published over 120 articles, numerous book chapters, and for those people comparing uh, that track record to some of the clinical scientists here who have 500 or 1,000 publications, over 100 in basic science is really tremendous. And he's got some really exciting work um, that we are lucky enough to hear about today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Palmer. Thank you. Well, this is a, a pleasure to uh, do DCRI Research Conference again and share with everybody a little bit more about what what we're doing in terms of pulmonary. And um, as was alluded to, I have, I have a, a pretty strong interest. Oh, here are my disclosures. Uh, I have NIH support. I have support actually recently from CDC NIOSH, a number of industry, and I'm a co-inventor on a patent. So I want to acknowledge all that. Um, I did want to uh, talk today a lot about uh, lung transplant, because that's what I grew up in. That's the, the area that really gets me the most excited in terms of translational science. But it's also, I recognize, a very <coughs> relatively narrow uh, niche. But what I'm going to share with you at the end is how we've used our experience in lung transplant, where we interface with patients with advanced lung disease, such as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, COPD, and other areas, how we've used that uh, experience and that translational science experience as a springboard to really grow a, a pretty broad portfolio of work we're doing now uh, with many of you in the room at, at the DCRI. And so uh, time permitting, I really want to just kind of highlight some of the exciting things going on across the board. But before we do that, I am going to focus in on a couple very specific research projects we're doing in lung transplant. And I would start by saying this is actually a really exciting time to, to talk about lung transplant. Um, as you can see, uh, I guess this is why they told me it's probably better to use this. So as you can see, uh, if I gave this talk in 1985, it would have been a pretty boring talk, right? You know, there were about five lung transplants performed worldwide. And the volume of lung transplants in the last 25 to 30 years has gone up dramatically, and it continues to go up. And it's always a couple years out of date in terms of the, the data that's reported, but it's now well over 4,000 lung transplants worldwide. So Again, not, not so big if you're used to hearing about 40,000, 60,000 patient cardiology studies, uh, but puts, puts us on par with heart transplant, liver transplant, lung transplant, about 4,000, still below kidney. But it's a, it's a pretty growing area, and it's actually the only solid organ transplant that continues to experience growth in terms of transplant volumes. And from a research point of view, uh, again, this is uh, worldwide registry data, there are some really interesting demographic changes in who we're transplanting. So when the field started uh, back in the 80s and early 90s, most of the transplants were in folks in this age category, so, sort of in the 40s to 60s. And what we've seen in recent years is a really dramatic rise in, in this orange group in patients that are older. There was a time patients were turned down based on age over 60 and certainly over 65, and we're seeing a lot of growth there. And in parallel with that, or in part, driving that growth is some of the changes in the demographics of patients that are getting transplanted. So while we continue to do lung transplants for patients with cystic fibrosis, shown here, um, and COPD, shown here, as well as alpha-1 and pulmonary hypertension, we see this really dramatic growth in this red subset of patients, which is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and they tend to be older patients. So changing age demographics, changing native diseases make it um, an interesting time uh, not, I wish I could tell you there are dramatic improvements in survival after lung transplant, but there aren't. Um, and that's why there's still a huge opportunity and it's still important to continue to do research. So compared to earlier, -er, one year survival has gone up from about 75% to um, maybe about 85% at most centers across the board. 
And long-term survival, if you look at the 50% survival, it's gone from about four years out to about six years for all transplants. If we looked only at large centers and we looked only at bilateral transplants, we'd see that the curves would be shifted out a little more. And most of our patients, uh, I, I give a, about a 50% survival at eight years based on the fact that we're a large volume center doing primarily bilateral transplants. But we still have a long way to go. So there's still a huge opportunity to do more research. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm actually going to talk about two projects we've done that are uh, registry projects using UNOS registry data. And I, and I think they're really fun projects to talk about because they have public policy implications and they represent collaborations with a number of different people uh, uh, in the organization. So lung allocation in the US. Lungs are allocated uh, by something called the LAS score. And that was implemented in May 2005 by UNOS, or the United Network for Organ Sharing, that, that kind of uh, regulates uh, allocation of, of uh, all the organs within the US. And one thing that was striking prior to May 2005 when the system was implemented was that lung patients on the waiting list had the highest percentage of deaths um, amongst all the groups. So um, maybe there would be more absolute numbers in some of the other organs. But a large percentage of people we would list for lung transplant would actually die before they'd ever make it to transplant. And Health and Human Services mandated that that change, that um, policy change in a way uh, from the previous system, which was really just time on the wait list, so you show up, you could be really sick, too bad, you're just going to have to wait your turn, to a different system based on um, sort of need. And that's what the LAS is designed to do. The LAS was designed to assign priority based on the risk of death without a transplant or the urgency, but also take into account, um, to some degree, utility, the probability of post-transplant survival. And so the LAS gives every one of our patients a number from 1 to 100 that is intended to reflect their net benefit. Um, I will tell you that algorithm weights um, urgency twice as much as utility. So it's more important in terms of getting a higher score if you're very, very sick and very likely to die, as opposed to what we think might happen with regards to post-transplant survival. And with regards to survival, it only considers that first year after transplant. Um, it also recognizes that it's very difficult to compare some features across one disease to another disease. So example, if you had a low um, lung function capacity on your pulmonary function test, it might mean one thing in IPF, but it might maybe not be as prognostically bad in CF or COPD. And so it takes into account these clinical variables, but also incorporates them into the native disease and then generates an LAS score. And, what, and this is a publicly available algorithm. What, what this is intending to do is model um, uh, what your survival might be like were you not to get a transplant, shown here. Model what your survival might be like were you to get a transplant, shown here. And then generate the area under the curve and call that the net benefit. And your LAS score ought to be proportional to what that net benefit is. And this is not our study, but this is a study out of Stanford that came out shortly after the LAS was implemented. And it basically did a lot of the things it was intending to do. So if we look at uh, uh, from listing in years and look at the incidence of deaths on the waiting list um, with the dotted dash line being prior to the implementation of LAS and the solid line being after the LAS, we can see that deaths on the waiting list over time from listing went down. So that was a good thing. That was one of the goals. And we also saw that, not surprisingly, the uh, time from listing to transplant went way up. We no longer had to game the system and say, oh, you might get sick in three years, so I'm just going to put you on our list now. We um, only needed to list people who actually needed to get transplanted. And so um, the wait times went down in part because of that. Fortunately, at least initially, um, in this report, there was not a big change in survival. So the pre and post survival, it, it, despite potentially transplanting sicker patients, we didn't see a big drop off in survival, which is good. And in fact, since the LAS was um, developed, there have already been changes to the LAS. And one of the obvious variables from, from a lung point of view that wasn't taken into account was PCO2. And that was rectified pretty quickly uh, with uh, 
uh, future iteration of the algorithm that took that into account. Um, but one of the things I was pretty interested in from a clinical point of view that was not represented in the LAS and that I challenged uh, uh, our fellow a couple years ago, Wayne, to look at with me was the LAS dynamics. And so I'm always struck by our patient gets an LAS score and um, you know, that tells us something about how they're doing at that static fixed point in time when we list them. But it doesn't tell us about the trajectory of how they were doing, if they were crashing and burning, going into the transplant, or if they were relatively stable. And so we had the idea that perhaps, um, in fact, I kind of believe that the trajectory prior to transplant would offer some prognostic information that was important beyond the actual score that they're given at transplant. And so we wanted to investigate that. Uh, and this is just an example of what, uh, what our coordinators do online. This is the mock uh, site where you can actually go and just enter data and get a, a score. But it's just what it looks like if you were to be a, a transplant coordinator entering data on a patient. And in fact, it, it reminded me that the lung allocation score actually changes on a daily basis due to age, just a tiny little incremental amount as every patient ages. But if someone were to get acutely worse, if we list at you and three weeks later, you were much more hypoxic or your CO2 went up, we'd enter that data and you'd get a new LAS score. And that's really what I was interested in looking at, is does that change uh, have some prognostic information in addition to whatever that score is uh, that it's capturing based on those variables at the time they're updated. And so for the study, um, it was a really nice collaborative study uh, that uh, Wayne did with David Vock. Uh, and some, some other folks in our group that we just published recently in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Um, we hypothesized that an acute increase in the LAS score prior to transplant would actually predict worse post-transplant survival. Um, and it really was a pleasure to work with, with David. Uh, David was a graduate student at NC State and also a DCRI intern who worked with us on a couple projects and Karen was kind enough to connect us. And I was very sad to see David go. He was a great collaborator. Um, and actually, as I'll talk about, I didn't really let him go. I continued to collaborate with him, um, even though the DCRI let him go. Uh, so the methods, <laughs> I know we tried to keep him. <laughs> the methods, the editorial comments will start to get thicker and thicker as the talk goes on. <laughs> that should have been in my disclosures. I, I can't avoid it. It's just my nature. So the methods for this study, it, this is a really nice registry study. We had UNOS registry data from the implementation of LAS uh, onward. And one of the things we had to do was define, um, define an acute change. And we thought about that a lot. And for the purposes of the analysis, the primary analysis, we defined an acute change as a change in the LAS score of five units within the 30 days prior to transplant. So we call it LAS delta greater than five. We actually looked at a number of other ways of defining that. And I'll talk about that a little later. Um, but in general, the results were fairly consistent across the primary analysis and other ways we did this. And then we used a Cox model to adjust for many other factors that might uh, uh, be relevant in terms of predicting survival after lung transplant, including the LAS at transplant. And this is just the uh, typical figure one walking through our study cohort. So UNOS registry, great. It's pretty complete data. It captures everyone in the US that was transplanted. From this period of time, we had uh, nearly 9,000 transplants. We really had only one primary exclusion, and based on how we define change, we needed folks to be listed at least 30 days so we could define if they had a change or not. So we excluded those that were listed and then transplanted within 30 days, and then just a few other exclusions, multi-organs, pediatrics, um, a few artifacts of when the system was implemented. Um, and so that gave us a cohort of 5,700 patients in whom uh, 700 or so had an LAS delta greater than five, and 5,000 whose LAS score changed by less than or equal to five. And because this system is required to generate, you know, everyone has to have an LAS score to get a transplant, the data on the LAS is complete. There's zero missing LAS data, except for these patients that were a little bit of an artifact of when the system transitioned from uh, pre-LAS to LAS. So our study cohort has complete data on the LAS score. And in a completely unadjusted way, um, we looked at this and showed, oh, this is kind of interesting. A change in LAS is associated with, um, as shown in this dashed green um, line, is associated with significantly worse post-transplant survival. These are the days from transplant now, as compared to those patients that didn't have that. 
But what's wrong with that? Well, it's completely unadjusted. So it's quite possible that maybe those patients just have higher LAS scores or other characteristics that would be associated with worse survival. Uh, and in fact, if we just look at the demographics of the patients that had a change in their LAS score, they tended to be uh, uh, patients that were older, that had restrictive lung disease, and in fact, they had higher LAS scores of transplant than those that did not have change. So then we went ahead and started to think about uh, uh, how these other variables are, are contributing to post-transplant outcomes and trying to determine if a change in LAS might have prognostic significance um, uh, independent of the effects of some of these other covariates, like the LAS itself at transplant. And one way we did this was by looking at LAS strata. And we were uh, uh, pretty happy and reassured to see that um, LAS stratas, as shown here in these four graphs, in each, of, in, in each of these LAS stratas, if you had a change in your LAS score by greater than five, your survival was um, significantly worse than if you did not. And then we went ahead and, and built a fairly um, uh, uh, complicated multivariate model where we adjusted for many other potential covariates. We considered um, things like the type of transplant, the native disease, the age, the LES strata. We also considered LES as a continuous variable. We accounted for in other models, donor characteristics, transplant center volume. Um, we did a sub-analysis where we considered only those patients with updates in the LES to ensure we're not um, biased in that way. Um, and basically, in every one of these adjusted analyses, we got the same result. And it was pretty striking. So independent of the LAS at transplant, having a change within 30 days, in other words, having a, a clinical worsening, an acute worsening in your status prior to transplant, was actually associated with uh, a significantly increased hazard for, for post-transplant death. And it was on par with getting listed um, in the highest of LAS strata. So we thought this was a pretty exciting, important effect. Um, I mentioned the other thing I want to say is we also spent a little bit of time thinking about, well, what if we slice this differently? What if we thought about uh, a different unit, for example, 2.5 instead of 5, or 10 or 15 instead of 5? Or what if we thought about a different time interval, like 7 days or 14 days instead of 30 days or 60 days? And we did all those analyses, um, in part because the annals reviewers asked us to do them, but in part because we were just really happy to do them and we thought they were important <laughs> analyses to do. And we were also pleased that this, this finding was pretty robust across uh, all of the different ways that we sliced this data. I think what we learned was that uh, the number of patients, um, particularly when you go out to the extremes, like there are very, very few, almost no patients that have a rise in 15 60 days from transplant, and so it became irrelevant to really look at that because the numbers were so small. But through most of these, we pretty much got the same result, which was really encouraging, and I think helped us get into, get into the annals because we did so many different uh, ways of looking at this, and the story continued to basically be the same. So well, this was a nice paper. Um, it demonstrated for the first time that the trajectory of this variable called the LAS, by which we allocate lungs the 30 days prior to transplant, that trajectory impacts survival after lung transplant, independent of the LAS uh, score itself and independent of many of the other variables that we think are important prognostically. And so we, we think this contributed a bit to the literature because it gave us something else to look at. As we think about post-transplant survival, and we also thought it was important because it kind of reminds us that when we think about prognostication, it's often not just at a static point in time, but it's the trajectory of how that patient's doing, either going into a transplant or whatever other you know, clinical event that might have something to do with how they do afterwards. Um, so that got us thinking a little bit more about um, net benefit. And so that's kind of the published story, and that was just published last year. This is the unpublished part of the story. Um, and while I showed you that the LAS change has an impact on survival after transplant, it doesn't really tell us how we should change how we allocate organs, because it's possible that that may have a greater effect on post-transplant outcomes or pre-transplant outcomes. And what we really want to do is think about net benefit and think about um, how do I allocate this scarce resource, this scarce resource in a way that um, prioritizes those patients who are going to get the greatest net benefit, which is really what the LAS system was designed to do. But when we looked at a lot of the literature um, 
that was out there, uh, as well as the data that was used to generate the LAS models, um, we were struck by how limited that research had been and thought there was an opportunity to contribute more to that. Um, so there, of course, there are no randomized studies that show transplantation confers a survival benefit. As with many surgical interventions, it's hard to design these studies um, and probably would not fly. Um, there was a very unfortunate paper that was published in the England Journal of Medicine by a guy named Ted Liu at the University of Utah, who literally says at meetings, I had one CF patient that got a transplant and they did badly. And he made it his career goal to do studies that said there's no survival benefit to lung transplant um, and used CF registry data combined with very old UNOS registry data and came up with a flawed analysis that he then had to um, actually write a retraction of part of the analysis. But it still got published in the New England Journal originally, and it did more disservice to, I think, the transplant community than anything because nobody wanted to refer CF patients after that. Um, and then more recently, the thing we've been dealing with is now that we have the LAS system, so I mentioned we don't have to have people uh, wait in line to get years and years of waiting time. Now we get these calls. Um, I have a really sick patient. Uh, you've never seen them before, but they're a nice young kid with CF. They just got acutely worse. They're on a ventilator. Can we transfer them and can you transplant them? And that presents a, another dilemma, which is how sick is too sick and is there some limit to where we say, wait a minute, you know, we, we ought not to be doing these transplants just because we can get a score and we can get a high score. Um, how do we balance the utility part? Um, so this, this is a really interesting thing to think about. I'm not going to pretend to have all the answers, but I'll share with you how we approached it. The, the other things that struck us about this literature in terms of survival benefit for transplant, um, pretty much every study used, used a Cox model. And, and it reminds me of the Stanford heart transplant example when we learned how to do SAS, that that's, it just, that's how you do this stuff. And, um, and the problem with that is that our transplant patients uh, undergo informed censoring. So the sicker patients are often the ones that get censored. And then that creates some bias in how we interpret survival benefit or not. And all of this research, except for one paper, was done prior to the implementation of the LAS. So even though we designed the system to help improve net benefit, nobody's really thought about how's that working. And almost all of the prior studies really looked at it in just a univariate kind of way. Well, if you have COPD, is there a survival benefit or not? If you have CF, is there a survival benefit or not? But we've just talked about how many, many other important covariates there are that can impact all this. So we wanted to take those into account too. And this is, um, this is a continued collaboration with David, who's now in the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota. And this is a project we've worked on uh, along with some of the other folks, um, uh, Wayne, who was involved, Mike Durheim, who's our fellow now, and, and some other folks in the group that worked on the previous paper, uh, as well as David's uh, uh, graduate school mentors who are part of this project. So rather than using the Cox model, I think the innovation of this approach was to take uh, a, a different statistical strategy that David had worked on in graduate school from the causal inference literature and use an accelerated failure time model to try and estimate in a different way what the residual lifetime of a patient might be had they been left on the waiting list as compared to the residual lifetime uh, if they underwent a transplant. And then use that as a way to adjust for many of these other covariates. And so we took our UNOS data set, but we updated it because it's a year later. We now have 1,300 folks who are listed for lung transplant, about 9,000 of whom underwent a single or bilateral lung transplant. And using that accelerated uh, time failure model, um, we came up with some really interesting data, I think, that we're going to be really excited to submit and hopefully get, get some feedback on. And I think the, the thing that was really interesting was that the most important determinants of the survival benefit of transplant were actually the LAS of transplant and the native disease. And so um, unlike some of the previous studies, we found that actually the greatest survival benefit is precisely for those patients with the highest LAS scores and with CF or IPF. But conversely and somewhat distressingly, we came to the conclusion that there were some patients with low LAS scores and obstructive disease that probably did not get a survival benefit with transplant and actually had reduced survival. And I'll show you how that looks. And this is um, a somewhat complicated slide, so I want to just kind of walk through it slowly. So it's the cumulative incidence of death by LAS strata from listing. So this is the cumulative incidence of death on this axis, and this is the days from listing. 
And it models either continued waiting, shown in red, or transplantation, shown in blue. And so this hits home the latter point I just made, which is in those patients with low LAS scores, um, at every uh, time point from listing onward, um, they were more likely to be alive if we left them listed rather than if transplanted um, at any one of these time points. And in the intermediate LAS strata, I probably should mention 35, about 38 is the median LAS score. So there's a fairly large number of patients that probably sit here, some that sit here, relatively few that sit in these higher strata. Um, it's certainly not a normal distribution, but it's the median's right around here. So in this, in this LAS strata, we're about net neutral in terms of survival benefit. And it's not until we get to higher LAS scores where we start to see um, after a period of days of listing, maybe about a year or so, that we start to see a consistent survival benefit to transplant as compared to continued listing. And it becomes more and more and more striking as we get into these very, very sick patients with higher LAS scores. So we thought that was very interesting. That's the first work that's tried to incorporate the LAS data and think about net benefit. It's using an innovative strategy from a statistical point of view. And it's a pretty striking conclusion. Um, you know, based on this data, we estimate that 76% of the adults that underwent lung transplant since the implementation of LAS had a two-year survival benefit. So I guess that's good. We're benefiting uh, the vast majority of patients. It's also good because we've identified some controversial diseases like CF or IPF, or particularly those patients with high LAS scores, where we're actually giving them a lot of benefit. Um, but we've also defined a subset of patients that do not sustain a net benefit. And so given the limited supply of donor lungs, we think this is very, very important and that we really need to prioritize those sickest patients. When I get that call about the CF patient on the ventilator that I never met before, I should probably say yes. Send her down immediately. We're going to put her on ECMO and we're going to transplant her because this transplant is the one thing that can give her tremendous net survival benefit. Um, but when I see that COPD patient who's, yeah, my quality of life stinks and I'm on a little bit of oxygen and I'm plodding along, uh, we probably ought not to offer transplant but think about continued medical management. Um, and, you know, although 35 is the median, our programmatic bias has always been to transplant these sicker patients. Um, and so our median LAS is probably well into the, into the 40s. And I don't think, I, I can't ever remember anyone we've ever listed recently that's had an LAS below 35. And it's, you know, so I, th I think if programs are smart, we can use this data and use that score as a really important prognostic tool to, to allocate this scarce resource. So if anyone has feedback on this, this paper has not been submitted. So feel free to tear it to shreds. We're going to incorporate those comments. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to do, so I wanted to give you an example of just some of the more substantive transplant-related outcome studies we're doing. And the last thing I wanted to do in the last 10 minutes or so before I take questions is really just give you a flavor of, of where we've gone in pulmonary. And it's been a really exciting uh, couple years to, to be a part of pulmonary at the DCRI. Uh, mainly because when I started, I was part of this, which was the little asterisk that uh, fell. It was GI, ID, pulmonary. I know there may have been a few other things stuck in there. Um, but in his infinite wisdom, Dr. Harrington encouraged me to develop pulmonary as a distinct area and saw some potential to doing that. And I think prior to that time, we really had two accomplishments. One was a multi-center clinical trial um, that we had done in lung transplant, and the other was that Kevin had, had secured the IPF net and was really putting together a, a wonderfully successful clinical trial network funded by the NIH. Um, but with regards to pulmonary space, we really hadn't had a lot of activity here at the DCRI. Um, and I think in the last couple of years, since 2012, we really expanded dramatically. We coordinate multiple trials, registries, and outcome studies. I think we mirror the building as a whole in terms of a mix of industry and NIH. And we may be uniquely translational because of my slant towards um, transplant and both uh, uh, clinical and laboratory-based research. And if we look at what we're doing right now in pulmonary in, in one specific disease area, IPF, it's, it's pretty staggering. I counted, I think, seven, seven different projects, and there's probably more. Kevin usually doesn't tell me everything he's doing, but 
it's that mystery that engages our relationship so well. Um, none of this would be possible if Kevin hadn't done such a good job on IPFNet, and I, I really want to credit his leadership on that project, and uh, it, it doesn't, you don't have to look far other than last week's New England Journal to see the fruits of his labor, as yet again he's had another uh, uh, important New England Journal paper from that IPFNet consortium. So by doing that, Kevin's brought credibility to all of us at the DCRI that want to pursue further studies in this area. Um, one of them is the uh, trial we're doing uh, with BMS that grew out of the uh, BMS Alliance that a number of individuals, Rob Califf, built with folks at BMS. Uh, we're also doing a IPF registry. Uh, uh, we're doing a similar but slightly more uh, uh, broad in scope registry that Kevin's leading with the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation. Kevin's also working on a study of fund application in IPF with Hal Collard at UCSF, funded by the NIH. And I recently learned we're going to be funded to do a very interesting study on the genetics of IPF. Uh, again, taking advantage, leveraging our end stage IPF patients who get transplant, having access to their DNA and tissue, we can do some really neat things that are different than some of the studies that have been done in terms of IPF genetics. And we can do that in collaboration with David Goldstein, and it's funded through Gilead. We're also doing a project, Gilead has an IPF drug, they have a LOXL2 inhibitor. LOXL2 synthesizes collagen, and so we're looking at LOXL2 expression in uh, explanted IPF tissue as well. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of things going on there. The um, couple, I just wanted to touch upon a couple of them because I, I really wanted to give everyone a flavor of how interactive our group has become and we're really happy about that. So not so much because this is an innovative registry. I think IPF Pro is probably from a registry point of view pretty boring. It's a relatively small registry. We are using the DCRI call center, which was fun to learn about. We're collecting translational biobanking samples and patient reported outcomes. But I, I think it was really fun for me to get to interact with uh, the outcomes group, learn about registries, and it's been uh, a great way for our, our core group of pulmonary folks to, to um, strengthen that relationship uh, w with outcomes and also to build a relationship with BI, Berger Ingelheim, who's a really important sponsor because they do they're one of the largest companies doing with a portfolio in respiratory disease. And so this study is up and running. The first site was activated on Monday. Um, and I especially want to thank Rex, Gay, and Beth for all the support on that study. Um, Kevin's been helpful in terms of thinking through how to design that. And then when we ran into a lot of trouble with German epidemiologists, <laughs> Emily was perfectly willing to roll up her sleeves and say, OK, I'll push back. And so that's, that's, been, a great, that's been a great study for us. Um, and we're looking forward to that getting started. Um, I also wanted to mention this BMS study. This is, uh, at one point, we called it SEAL. It's no longer called SEAL. It's just the safety and efficacy of a LPA receptor antagonist in IPF. It's a phase two multicenter study. Um, I want to mention this because LPA antagonism is a really exciting scientific strategy to treat fibrosis. Um, we think that uh, regulates fibroblast migration into sites. Um, like the lung where fibrosis occurs. And there's really compelling preclinical data that supports this idea. Um, it's a pretty complicated protocol. It has way more than it should. It has a phase one-like intensive PK part, an exploratory biomarker assessments, both in the blood and in the BAL. It has HRCT imaging, quantitative changes in lung fibrosis, hyperpolarized helium imaging. And I think for me, it provided many, many lessons learned about how to deal with BMS, the BMS Alliance. And I think if anyone's dealing with BMS, I'm happy to share those lessons learned. Um, if you're not dealing with BMS, but you might be, you probably should talk to us. Um, I, I would say Laurie and Jamie, the two other junior faculty in uh, uh, pulmonary at the DCRI, have done a, an amazing job kind of owning that study and really working with BMS through some of the challenges. It's good to know about Kevin Hurley. He helps with the BMS Alliance and has been a good asset. Um, I especially want to thank the, the, really the clinical management team who's trudged on through some really tough times with this study. Um, Laura came on as a project leader after several other project leaders had come and went and uh, definitely took it you know, right in the square jaw and said, I can do it, and is doing it with a lot of help from Sarah. And I think I've, I've used Maureen to help me model professionalism when we've had to interact with BMS. And 
stay positive and focused. And so it's, it's been another great example where a lot of different people had to work together to, to get this study up and running. And hopefully it's turned the corner. Um, I wanted to mention a couple other ways we're collaborating. Uh, uh, Murdoch is one because COPD is a real growth opportunity for us. I, I talked about IPF and transplant, and those are two relatively rare diseases. Uh, COPD is clearly our most common bread and butter pulmonary disease, and we honestly hadn't done much in COPD. But we've gotten more interested in COPD for a couple reasons. COPD is obviously a hot button issue in terms of readmissions now, so people are very interested in uh, factors that drive COP readmissions, how to modify and prevent readmissions, because that's going to impact on hospital bottom line. And so we have some really interesting collaborations with Jill O'Hare at Wake Forest, looking at two center data and interventions they're doing at Wake and thinking about how to, how to grow that. We're also looking at collaborations internally. Um, but one I just wanted to mention is that's been something we talked about for a couple years now and I think are finally going to be funded to do uh, is through the Murdoch study. And that's to basically take that infrastructure that has tagged 10,000 patients, um, not surprisingly, many of whom are smokers and some of whom report self-reported COPD. And so we want to take about 1,400 participants who we think either have COPD based on self-report or at risk for COPD based on their age and smoking history and actually do spirometry on them and apply a, a questionnaire to help determine their, their COPD gold risk strata um, and understand a little bit more about COPD and its treatment in the real world. Um, and that's something that Jamie Todd has really done a great job on with a lot of help from Mike, our fellow, and Kristen's been a great partner for that as well as the Murdoch team and Carl's gotten very engaged recently helping on the stats side. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was just kind of the spectrum of what we're doing in terms of more uh, basic and preclinical research. And that includes three NIH uh, UO1s that we now have. Um, one is the Lung Regeneration Repair Consortium, which is really designed to promote collaborative science in lung regeneration and repair and also train the next generation of researchers. Another one uh, that just got funded is the Molecular Atlas of Lung Development, and that's a collaborative project with Bob Clark at RTI. And that is to integrate data. It's an incredibly ambitious, neat project to fund sites to do specific projects to generate data uh, that help us understand how, the lung, how you go through the stages of molecular lung development, what regulates turning on and off genes that then create bronchi and alveoli and make normal lung. And if we understand normal lung development, then maybe we can understand a little bit more about how diseases deviate from that and how to, back to the first project, how to repair the diseased lung. And so that's, that's a really exciting project. And then we also uh, recently uh, got funded to create a clinical trials and organ transplant network, a CTOT network, which is new for me. I hadn't, hadn't been funded through NIAID. They fund a lot of kidney transplant research, but not lung research. Um, but we're really excited about that, and I want to mention that because that'll be the talk I give in two years, is hopefully the clinical trials that we're doing through this CTOT project, the Lung Transplant Clinical Trial Network, where the last time I talked a few years ago was about CMV prevention, comparing different durations of, of a drug strategy. And what we've done is developed an immunological strategy where we think we can measure your CMV-specific immunity and make a decision in an individual about whether or not we can discontinue therapy. And so there's, some clinical, there's a clinical trial and mechanistic studies. And there's also a, a study of lung dysfunction and its immunological mechanisms. So there's, there's a lot going on in that project. This is the organizational structure of CTOD. It has five clinical sites, Duke, Hopkins, UCLA, Toronto, and Cleveland Clinic. And I, I want to acknowledge Kent, who is a key collaborator here at Duke and a core lab leader, um, as well as all the folks that, that helped there. But I also want to acknowledge that was a, a really ambitious, hard grant to put together. Julie, big help, Taylor, Joanna Downer, if anyone's worked with Joanna before, if you haven't, you should. She's a huge resource in the dean's office. Laurie and Ashley, Iris, Paramita, and then Michael, who stepped up to help with Paramita leaving. Um, so CTOT, really exciting new project. And then just to mention the LRC and the lung map would not have been possible. That funding would not have occurred without the hard work of Brenda. And then Lara, who's continued to support uh, LRC from the beginning and also helping on lung map with Jerry. So that's a far reaching view of what pulmonary is doing right now. So you, uh, you can see while I like transplant and it continues to be a major area of focus, 
we really are excited to grow in a variety of different ways, and we're doing that in COPD and IPF and other lung diseases. And I'm not afraid to tackle a project if it's basic or if it's translational or if it's clinical. I think we have the depth of expertise and knowledge to be able to put together teams that can solve those problems. Um, and uh, we even do outcomes. I thought that was really funny that when I thought about what I wanted to talk about today, I was like, well, this is the stuff I'm really excited about, this net benefit thing. This is the paper we're working on. Um, and it's, it's a really nice core team of people. I mentioned most of them already. And the more we get to interact with all the talented people in the building, the better, because I, I really think this is the unmet opportunity. The, you know, the cardiologist, cardiovascular morbidity, down like that. Lung, we've got a long way to go. We're now the third leading cause of death in the US, up from the fourth leading cause. Not really something to brag about. Um, so there is a huge opportunity to do the kind of research, use the tools we have in this building to impact on lung disease. So I hope everyone leaves motivated to collaborate with us and find ways to do that. Thank you. Great, that was really outstanding stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, um, so I've talked before with Mike and, and Jamie and briefly with you about how you might use Medicare, Medicaid type data in this area, which um, in my very brief foray into the literature, I don't think people are really tapping into that very much, understanding that the lack of clinical information that you might need, but even from a, a descriptive perspective, um, there, you know, I think we should talk again about that. I agree. Yeah, the more I read about what you're doing, the more I think it's a huge opportunity. And whether you do it as a standalone or marry it with other data sets that we have, registries we're building, transplant, yeah. all those are opportunities completely. Good. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask a little bit uh, about the RPA, the phosphodiesel. I think. I used to work with the group collaboration uh, who works with the RPA and aggregation and uh, in other states. Do you have any collaboration with the other group, cardio, cardiology, cardiovascular group uh, who works with the LPA? It's a very no. important point. And you, you used to work with the tissue and blood also, plasma or just tissue? So, so maybe there's a couple parts to that question. I think uh, we're not doing any studies. The, the only study we're doing with the LPA is a clinical trial. But as part of that clinical trial, we are banking um, blood, uh, serum, um, DNA from the serum, uh, cells from the serum. Uh, and, and so there would be opportunities to look at translational mechanisms in terms of how it might be acting. But the preclinical science, a lot of that was done up at Harvard by Andy Tager who had a model where he would give bleomycin, get lung fibrosis, and looked at how the, the, a drug like this would block migration of those fibroblasts in the lung. Thank you, Mike. Sure. Great, thank Wait, you. one more question. One more. So, so Scott, when you guys input that data in to get the score, the LAS, is that right, the LAS score? Yep, is, LAS that, score. is that just a data, that data doesn't stay with that website, it's just a tool that you guys use in this. Is that correct? And then, then you enter that data, the score into the patient's record. How does the how does it get, I guess, translated? Because you guys mentioned that you have yeah. everybody has a score, right? But I'm just trying to figure out: does it stay on that website, or does it stay within the? So you know, know. So we and that was actually a mock. That's the publicly available phase where you can go in and just play with numbers and see how they affect someone's score. You you would go into a secure website, actual the data, actual the patient data, enter the actual patient data, um, and that patient would get a score, and that would live with UNOS, and then there's something called DonorNet. So as a donor becomes available, the DonorNet has all those scores and looks at your blood group and regions and prioritizes uh, long. So we might get um, page. Now we actually pay someone to do that call because it's incessant, but someone would get a page that would say, this organ is available, and you'd you know, potentially have a match based on what their LAS score is in the organ. So UNOS really owns that, and it's an all automated, secure, online, kind of technologically neat process. Great. Thank you again. Thank you.